Okay, I think it's it's time to start on the new session. Uh, so in this session, we have three speakers, and the first one will be uh, Professor An Liang. And uh, Professor An Liang received his bachelor degree uh, in thermal and power engineering from Harbin Institute of Technology, and a PhD in mechanical engineering from the Hong Kong uh, University of Science and Technology. Uh, after graduation, he worked as a visiting scholar and a postdoc fellow in the same research group in Hong Kong UST. And his research uh, interest covers fuel cells, leasing based batteries, flow batteries, and water electrolysis. Currently, Professor An Liang is an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Hong Kong Poly U. Uh, so, the topic of Professor An Liang's uh, presentation is fuel cells powering the future. Uh, so next will come Professor An Liang. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Ni, for your uh, kind uh, introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, firstly, I would like to thank Professor Huang's kind of invitation. And I'm very pleased to be here today, share with you my research. And my today's topic will be the uh, fuel cell. Actually, it's the liquid fuel cells. So, yes. So the main message I would like to deliver today are it's here. Today's energy system is not sustainable. So to make the energy system sustainable, so the fuel cell is uh, one of the potential solutions. And uh, following by the introduction to the direct liquid fuel cells and our research on this topic. Finally, I'm going to give a summary. So let me start with the bigger picture. So uh, the conventional power is generated by the fossil fuels, which is to burn fossil fuels to uh, generate heat, and then the heat will drive the um, turbine to generate the mechanical energy, and the mechanical energy uh, converted to the electricity by a electric generator. So as you can see from the fossil fuels to electricity, there are quite a few steps, so which means the efficiency is not high. And another issue is that during this process, the combustion process also emits carbon dioxide and other pollutants. So today's energy system is uh, not efficient, not clean, so not sustainable. And the per perhaps another ch and challenge issue is uh, more challenging and uh, the huge gap between the energy demand and the supply. So the currently the global power consumption is uh, around 14 terawatts. So it has been estimated that this number will double by 2050. So the question here is, uh, wh where is the uh, extra energy come from? So without doubt, we have to increase the use of the renewables like the solar, wind, and biomass, okay? So that we have to increase the use of renewables in the years to come. So here is the fuel cell. Fuel cell actually is the energy conversion technology, which can directly convert the chemical energy stored in the fuel and to the electricity. So here is the... Um, sketch showing the, uh, the fuel cell. So the fuel can be from the electro fuel, like by the uh, ele uh, electrolysis process, which can convert the water into the hydrogen. So of course, this process can be powered by the solar power and the wind turbine, uh, wind uh, power. So, and also the fuel can be a biofuels, which can derive from the biomass uh, process. So that we, uh, the fuel cell technology can convert the chemical energy in the fuels, the electro fuels and the bio fuels directly into the electricity. And also the fuel cell can be used anywhere like a station, a stationary um, power generation and also the fuel cell electric vehicles and uh, even the portable electronic devices. And the fuel cell is very clean. If we use hydrogen as the fuel, the fuel cell only emits heat and water, zero emission. And if we use the methanol and ethanol, and the fuel cell also emits carbon dioxide, but don't be afraid of carbon dioxide here because it will return to the plant, which are used to produce the methanol and the ethanol, so-called carbon neutral uh, fuels. And the fuel cell is more efficient as compared to the conventional power generation uh, technologies. Uh, there are many types of fuel cell. Our focus will be the direct liquid fuel cells. You may ask why there is a di direct here, uh, because previously uh, 
uh, the most mature fuel cell technology is uh, using the hydrogen, okay? Uh, to, uh, uh, from the fuel point of view, hydrogen is a perfect fuel. The problem associated with the uh, hydrogen fuel cell is the, how to handle and the storage and uh, uh, transport the hydrogen safely. Uh, safely. So here we use the, um, directly use the liquid fuel in the fuel cell, we call the direct liquid fuel cell. And the other one is indirect liquid fuel cells. We can uh, handle and transport and store the liquid fuel first, and then we can go to the some uh, few uh, processing like the reform, reforming process to reform the liquid fuel into the hydrogen first, and then feed the hydrogen to the hydrogen fuel cell afterward. So in that case, we call it indirect liquid fuel, uh, fuel cells. So our focus will be the direct liquid fuel cells. So we use the liquid fuel directly, uh, do not use the hydrogen from the liquid fuels. And the fuel cell, there are two items here, the fuel, okay? And uh, the other one is the cell. The fuel actually is the, you know, the reactant and the cell actually is a reactor. So we have the two cables here. And from the fuel point of view, and uh, the liquid fuel has a very high energy density. And so that we can carry, uh, produce more electricity, okay, in the same uh, volume. And also the fuel can be easily derived from the bell mass, so that is a sustainable fuel. And uh, for example, the methanol and the ethanol is uh, carbon and neutral fuels. And from the reactor cell point of view, uh, this uh, reactor is uh, simple and uh, compact, and potentially it has very high uh, efficiency. And um, uh, different from the, you know, the large scale power generation um, system, this uh, fuel cell can be operated silently and no moving parts. So also it's possible to operate the fuel cell at room temperature as compared to the high temperature, high pressure of the conventional uh, power generation technology. And here is the, uh, some potential fuels for the, high, uh, for the fuel cells. So the, this one is the, uh, hydrogen, okay. So uh, the only problem associated with the hydrogen is, you know, the, um, the difficulties in the delivery storage and the handling. And uh, so that the people trying to use some liquid fuel like the methanol, ethanol, and ethylene glycol, we call the alcohol uh, in the fuel cells. Okay, so they are very easy to store, transport, and handle. And uh, in the same time, they have very high energy density. So how does um, uh, liquid fuel cell work? So here shows the uh, direct methanol fuel cell uh, working principle. So as you can see, there are three components, anode and the cathode in the middle electrolyte membrane. And uh, so that in the anode, we feed the methanol solution into the anode and the methanol reach the reaction site and to off, uh, will be oxidized to produce protons and uh, electrons and also carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide will go back to the flow channel and went out of the anode. And the, the electrons will go through the external circuit and generate the power and arrive at the cathode. You may ask why the electrons will go um, naturally to the cathode because there is a, a potential difference on both sides. And the, the, at this interface, the electron leaving cause this interface uh, be uh, uh, positively charged. And then at this interface and uh, the arriving electrons will cause this interface negative charge. So that positive charge, negative charge will call, uh, form uh, electric field through the membrane. So that the protons will migrate from the anode to the cathode through the membrane. And on the cathode, the electrons, protons, and the oxygen meet and react produce the, what, of course, the hydrogen uh, could be the pure, uh, pure oxygen and also could be the oxygen from the air. Even sometimes we can use hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so the, here is the um, reaction at the anode and the reaction at the cathode. So during this process, you can see this uh, technology, this device can convert the chemical energy stored in the mass node directly into the electricity. Okay, so that's the working principle. And, but the bad news here is the um, low performance uh, of the direct liquid fuel cell. Here I show the performance, the, of the other performance of the direct ethanol fuel cells because uh, uh, my focus will be the direct ethanol fuel cell. So I, uh, before our project, I show you the 
uh, see if that, uh, the peak power density at that time is only 30 millibar per cm squared. So uh, why the performance is very low is because of three losses in the fuel cells. The first one uh, will be the activation law, which is associated with the sluggish kinetics of the uh, electrochemical reaction on both sides. And the second one will be the ohmic loss, which is associated with the ion or electron transport. Uh, we know that the electron transport is not a big deal in the fuel cell because uh, most of the components are made of the uh, very good uh, electron conductors. So that the ohmic loss is majorly uh, caused by the ion transport through the uh, membranes. And the last one will be the transport loss. It uh, um, you know, uh, happens in the high current density. Uh, this is caused, uh, because, uh, caused by the mass transport limitation. For example, if your um, the delivery rate of a reactant is smaller than the reaction rate, it will cause the, you know, uh, the transport loss. Okay? So to increase the fuel cell performance, we have to uh, decrease the three uh, losses. And uh, here are some challenges uh, about the materials. So uh, because I'm not working on the materials, I'm not a material researcher, I try, um, I try best to uh, introduce some background of the challenges uh, for the uh, materials. The first one is the sluggish kinetics. So uh, uh, because of on the both side, and uh, particularly for the liquid fuels, it's uh, sometimes really hard to uh, uh, oxidize them into the carbon dioxide and the water. So that we have to uh, develop a highly active anode and the cathode catalyst to uh, address this issue. And the second uh, challenge is the series of fuel crossovers. Uh, because we feed the fuel into the anode, but the fuel cannot stay there. So if uh, we cannot finish uh, the fuel uh, uh, in time, so that uh, the fuel, uh, the membrane is uh, also permeable to the fuel, so that the fuel can cross the membrane and arrive at the castle. And uh, the presence of the fuel at the castle will cause uh, two problems. Uh, number one is to uh, uh, reduce the uh, fuel utilization efficiency, and number two is the uh, the fuel is the, the cath uh, cathode catalyst is also active to the fuel so that it will be a fuel oxidation reaction and an oxygen reduction reaction so that it will be a inner circuit so we call it mixed potential at the cathode it will um, decrease the cathode potential and therefore uh, uh, decrease the fuel cell performance so that's a uh, fuel crossover so we have to uh, develop the low fuel uh, permeability uh, membrane and also we can uh, develop some uh, fuel tolerant cathode catalyst to address this issue. And the third one will be the uh, fuel uh, fl uh, water flooding problem. So uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, the membrane is not perfect. It's uh, permeable to the ions and also permeable to the fuel and also permeable to the water. So the, uh, the water will arrive at the castle and accumulate it in the castle. We know that the, the water will uh, block the uh, pores in the castle, but we know that the oxygen is the one of the reaction at the castle. So the, uh, the pores will be occupied by the water, so that will block the, you know, the water, uh, the oxygen transport uh, pathways. So, so that in this case, the oxygen have to dissolve in the water first and then diffuse into the reaction set which will create a large barrier for the oxygen transport to the reaction site. So that we call the water fl flooding phenomena. So in this, um, uh, to address this issue, we have to um, develop the low perme uh, water perme uh, permeability membranes. And also we can design and uh, manipulate the, you know, the wettability of the cathode structure and uh, try to passively uh, remove the water okay, to the castle the flow field okay by using something like the capillary force okay and so another issue about the uh, material is the high cost uh, because for the um, uh, liquid fuel we have to use some very expensive planning based catalyst and also we use the methane membrane okay from the DuPont the largest uh, chemical uh, company in US very expensive and uh, so here shows the challenge of the transport. As you can see, this fuel cell uh, structure is very complicated, including the nanoscale catalyst layer, which is made of the 
uh, nano uh, uh, nano structured catalyst and also some uh, bender to uh, to bind them together and also the micro uh, skewed diffusion layer and uh, the micro skewed flow channels as you can see this is a multi skew and also the when the fuel is fed into um, the anode and carbon dioxide will generate it so it will cause uh, uh, liquid phase and uh, gas phase okay in the um, in the uh, in the uh, solution and then multi component if this uh, fuel cannot be 100% oxidized into carbon uh, dioxide and water it will uh, produce some intermediate proteins so that is multi component as you can see this uh, fuel cell structure is uh, uh, quite complicated and also the transport process is uh, uh, complicated as well. So now I would like to introduce some uh, our research on this uh, topic. The first one will be the direct ethanol fuel cell, which means we use the ethanol as the fuel for the uh, fuel cells. When we start to uh, research direct ethanol uh, fuel cells, we uh, do not use the uh, acid membrane, which conducts protons. We use the alkaline membrane, which conducts OH minus. As you can see, uh, by using of alkaline membrane, you can see the electrical potential is much lower than the um, acid media, which means the faster kinetics. Okay, and the by using uh, the faster kinetics is driven by the uh, using the alkaline membrane, so which allow us to use some cheaper materials. So that in the anode we use the PT free catalyst, actually the palladium catalyst. Uh, um, uh, in the last uh, section, uh, Professor Shaw mentioned that palladium is not uh, cheap anymore, so that we, we need to reconsider the catalyst in the anode. So here we use the platinum uh, catalyst, and, uh, and as a cathode, we use, we use the cobalt uh, based uh, catalyst. And uh, previously, uh, they used uh, um, platinum PTSN as anode catalyst, and as a cathode, they used uh, uh, platinum uh, catalyst. So, uh, so that we uh, designed some uh, single cell fixtures and we designed the testing system. Here is the real picture for the, uh, our fuel cell uh, fixture and here is our uh, testing system. So by doing so, we found that the uh, peak power density is increased uh, to the uh, from the 30 to 90 millibar per cm square, even with some cheap materials, it's cheap membranes and also cheap catalysts on both sides. So uh, here is another question related to this uh, uh, fuel cell system is uh, we, uh, we tried uh, an ion exchange membrane which uh, theoretically conducts uh, OH minus uh, anion. And also we used uh, a neutral membrane, a PBI membrane, also the canine exchange membrane which theoretically conducts uh, a uh, canine. Uh, uh, so that we try these three membranes, but we found that the three membranes works in this, uh, all the three membranes works in this uh, system. So that the question here is, what's the charge carrier across the membrane indeed for this uh, fuel cell system? To answer this question, uh, as you uh, design this setup, uh, I used um, as the fuel in the anode, but as a cathode, uh, in, in order to collect the, you know, the cathode species, so that I change the uh, gas oxygen or gas air into the liquid hydrogen peroxide as the oxygen in the cathode. So that is because it's in liquid phase so that uh, all the cathode species can be collected. And then I put it into the IC system to conduct the analysis. And after that, I can um, correlate, you know, the, uh, the flux through the membrane, the ion flux through the membrane with the current density. So here's the result. This line showing the perfect, if this membrane is a perfect canine conductor, so that the point should be close, okay, to this line. And if the membrane is a perfect anion conductor, so the point, okay, should be close to this, uh, this line. So um, by using this through membrane, we found that all the points are closer to the anion conductor. So that no matter, Regardless of the memory used, the main charge carrier, the main ion conductor through the memory is the anion in this uh, fuel cell system. So this uh, result is uh, contrary to the 
conventional uh, wisdom that the sodium ion conductor only conducts sodium ions. Okay, so in this multi ion system, it's uh, uh, it's really hard to see. Okay, and we check the effect of memory thickness on this uh, uh, ion distribution. So we found that uh, when the memory be becomes thicker, so this uh, more uh, closer to this uh, int uh, intrinsic uh, property. For example, we when we increase the thickness of a canine exchange membrane, so that the point is uh, closer, okay, to the canine conductor, perfect canine conductor. So that's uh, another work. And uh, so uh, here is the, our second work on the direct ethanol fuel cells. So we uh, um, we uh, build a hybrid direct ethanol fuel cells. So here is the basic idea. As you can see. Uh, no matter is uh, I see the ion clamp media, the theoretical voltage for a um, for a type of fuel cell is fixed. Uh, for example, for the uh, direct ethanol fuel cell, is a one point fourteen uh, watt uh, volt. And uh, but the difference is uh, for the ion clamp media, the anode potential is uh, even lower. But uh, for the cathode potential, is uh, even higher in the ethanol media. So the question here is if we can combine the low potential anode. And the high potential cathode together, we can get a high um, voltage output fuel cells. But the thing is, we can control the anode uh, environment by adding some ankle into the solution. But for the gas phase, it's really hard to you know uh, to change the environment. I mean the pH value. So that uh, uh, inspired by the previous uh, how to uh, collect uh, you know the cathode species. So we change this gas uh, oxygen into the hydrogen peroxide liquid oxygen. So that for the liquid phase, we can easily add some acid into the solution to change the environment. So as you can see here, when we change the oxygen to the hydrogen peroxide, we can see that we um, the anode potential is the same, minus 74, but the cathode potential is the even positive. So that 1.78. So that we if we can combine the low potential anode and the high potential cathode, we can get high voltage output fuel cell. So here is our basic idea. So here is the working principle for this hybrid fuel cell. Uh, on the anode, we uh, use the fuel in the alkaline media, but as the cast, we use hydrogen peroxide as the acid media. So this uh, alkaline anode and the acid cathode result in one high voltage output fuel cells. So here is a comparison among the uh, theoretical voltage, okay, for different types of fuel cells. The first one is the PAM fuel cell, actually the hydrogen oxygen fuel cell. So the theoretical voltage is 1.23. And for the direct mass no fuel cells, is theoretical voltage is 1.21. And the direct ethanol no fuel cell is 1.14. So that if we use this hybrid concept, as you can see, the theoretical voltage is uh, increased to the 2.52 volt. It's, uh, it's uh, more than two times higher than the conventional direct ethanol fuel cells. So by doing so, we uh, also test this uh, 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 fuel cell. Okay, so as you can see, the peak power density is further increased to the 240 millibar per cm square, which is much, much higher than the conventional acid, conventional alkaline uh, uh, fuel cells. And uh, you can see that it's, uh, this high performance is mainly caused by the high voltage output. And uh, after that, I uh, optimize this uh, fuel cell structure and also the, the membrane thickness so that by doing so, we found the, uh, the peak power density can further increase to the 360 millibar per cm square. A key factor here is the thickness of the, uh, the membrane. I uh, use a very thin uh, membrane uh, like the 25 micrometer, not even 211, so that the peak power density can reach 360 millibar per cm square. Okay, so this uh, figure uh, summary uh, summarizes, you know, the uh, the all the uh, peak power density divided by the direct ethanol fuel cells. As you can see, our results actually is uh, on the top of this uh, chart. So here is our uh, third research and direct ethylene glycol because this system is not applica only uh, uh, not applicable to the ethanol fuel cell is can 
also applicable to the acetylene glycol. So that we try this acetylene glycol in this uh, fuel cell uh, uh, system. So as you can see here, it's a working principle and uh, it's quite uh, similar to the um, uh, direct ethanol fuel cells, okay? And uh, also we uh, designed this uh, single cell, actually it's a passive, okay, passive uh, um, delivery mode of the fuel in the fuel cells. And uh, we uh, try the, uh, the fuel cell performance every curve at different temperatures and also examine the stability of the operation, okay? And also we uh, conduct the long-term discharging is uh, more than 300 hours and the fuel cell can maintain the, um, the voltage for a given uh, current density can ma uh, maintain the voltage at uh, 80%. And after that, we uh, design this uh, uh, stack, actually it's uh, um, four uh, single cells. So, uh, uh, two single cells actually they are uh, and the performance is uh, quite uh, uh, close okay so for that uh, we also do this uh, uh, demonstration because uh, uh, in the castle that we use the hydrogen peroxide so that this uh, fuel cell can be used in some air free uh, environment so that we try this uh, in the underwater environment and here it uh, is in the ambient uh, environment as you can see the performance is no big uh, difference and actually, this project is done by my PhD students and also the two final year project students. So we designed this fuel cells and assemble them, and so to do the demonstration, okay, for power mini fun. And the last example of our research, actually, this is the um, actually it's a, a, a same. Um, Theme-based project led by the Professor Zhao in Hong Kong UST, and uh, I was uh, co I'm the supervisor the co in this project. Uh, my uh, job is to uh, do the uh, you know, fuel cell uh, assembling and the testing and the cells uh, level the evaluations. So that we uh, don't use uh, the conventional liquid fuels. We use uh, a new liquid fuels uh, called uh, electrically rechargeable liquid fuels. We call E fuel. So here is the e fuel system, and uh, the e fuel can stored in the, the tank, and it can be recharged by the e fuel charger and powered by the wind turbine or the solar panels. After that, we can distribute and deliver the uh, e fuel tank to the you know to the uh, and the e fuel to the end users. And uh, here we can see in the household and also electric uh, vehicle. So we can use the uh, put input the e fuel into the uh, fuel cell and to convert the chemical energy stored in the e fuel directly to the electricity. So that's the uh, concept of this uh, e fuel storage system. And so here is some uh, advantage of this uh, e fuel and uh, wide material selectivity and excellent uh, reactivity. Because for the conventional liquid fuels, the problem is uh, uh, the, sl uh, the sluggish kinetics of the uh, electrochemical reaction. So here they have the excellent electrochemical reactivity and the faster reaction kinetics. And the more importantly, this uh, fuel can be recharged and recycled. Okay, so that is, has a very low fabrication cost. And uh, so uh, the main uh, motivation is the faster kinetics. So even we don't use some uh, catalyst, we only use some uh, carbon-based material like the uh, graphite felt. So here is a working principle. We can uh, convert the e fuel. Here is the vanadium ions. Okay, so uh, on the anode we can convert to the uh, from V two and to V three and release the electrons. And then electrons go through a uh, external circuit generate power. And as cathode oxygen will be reduced. Okay, by um, the combination of the protons and the electrons. So to generate a work. So here is the overall reaction. So here is our um, uh, fabrication of the uh, fuel cell uh, fixture used in this uh, e-fuel system, e-fuel cell. And uh, so you can see that the peak power density can reach, at room temperature can reach 300 millibar per cm square. It's very high. Actually, here's some, uh, summary, some uh, conventional uh, liquid fuel like formic acid, methanol, ethanol. So this result is much higher than conventional 
liquid fuels. And uh, even because uh, um, this uh, e-fuel uh, system, uh, e-fuel uh, solution has some uh, sulfuric acid, so that the freezing point for them is around the minus 30 uh, degrees C. And so that I try this uh, e-fuel cell in the, um, in the low temperature environment, for example, minus 20. So that I designed this uh, setup. So here is a uh, low temperature chamber. So I examined the uh, uh, EFU uh, cell so that uh, at, even at the minus 20, they show some you know, conductivity and also the electrode and the membrane. So that electrode also shows some uh, reactivity at uh, uh, minus 20 degrees C. So by uh, after checking of the e fuel and electrode and membrane workable in the uh, uh, minus 20 degrees C. So we move forward to check the uh, performance of the fuel cell. As you can see, even at the minus 20, we can, this fuel cell can also offer the uh, 80, uh, 80 millibar per cm square. So this performance is uh, even uh, higher than the temperature, uh, the performance, okay, achieved by the conventional fuel cell, which used uh, liquid fuels on the, you know, the room temperature. So that that's a huge potential for this type of uh, fuel cell at the cold area. So here is uh, some uh, demonstrations. So we uh, fabricate two uh, single cells and we uh, create a, a, a cold, cham uh, cold chamber and maintain temperature at uh, uh, minus uh, 20 degrees C. We uh, put this uh, a single cell in this uh, cold chamber for uh, more than 24 hours. And then uh, we start up this uh, fuel cell can uh, generate electricity and also power this uh, LED lights. So here is a demonstration. All right, so here is uh, some summaries. And the fuel cell is an enabling technology for the use of a renewable energy. And the breakthrough in the fuel cell research requires the interdisciplinary approach like the materials, electric chemistry, nanotechnology, and the chemical engineering, uh, even the mechanical engineering. And uh, we have developed some high performance uh, liquid fuel cells. And in the future, we will strive to reduce the uh, cost and the improve the uh, durability. Uh, so here is ac acknowledgement. I would like to thank my uh, formal students and also the current students. Uh, UG uh, master and the PhD and postdoc uh, students and also my family members and uh, my gratitude also goes to the financial support from the uh, government and also our university. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you Professor Anliang for your very inspiring uh, presentation. So if, if there are any questions, um, please uh, use the chat to type. Actually, I just saw one question. So, dear Professor Anliang, is the substrate important? Uh, some researchers use the carbon paper, while your substrate is nickel form and carbon clothes. Does these substrates affect the contact between the catalyst and the membranes? So, Professor Anliang. Uh, uh, yes, so actually, we use the uh, carbon clothes in the cathode, and uh, we use the uh, nickel form in the uh, anode. Because uh, in this uh, fuel cell, we feed the fuel together with the liquid electrolyte together. We want to enhance the master transport so that we use the uh, uh, nickel foam because it has very high uh, porosity, as high as 95%. And also the nickel foam, uh, nickel foam or substrate can also help the uh, fuel oxidation. So that's the uh, two reasons we use the nickel foam, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, and also you mentioned that you know contact. Actually, it's a big problem because we cannot press in one tad because you know the 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 the, the surface of the nickel foam is very sharp. It's very uh, it's easy to um, the break and also the penetrate the memory. So that when we uh, assemble the fuel cells, we, we should be very uh, careful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Anliang, for your answer, and also thank you, all Lu Wei Peng, for your question. So, any other questions? Um, maybe Anlian, I have a, a minor one. So I think it's very interesting for you to propose the hybrid fuel cell, and you can you 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 have a, a theoretical open circuit voltage of around two point five volt, right? Yes. But when you show the current density voltage curve, I think uh, the voltage uh, is is actually under two volt, right? Yes, exactly. It's one point yeah, so, so, six. Yeah. 
Yeah, so what is the, what caused the big difference between the theoretical voltage and its actual voltage? Okay, thank you very much. It's a very good question because uh, it's a uh, uh, major because of the decomposition of the hydrogen plus at the cathode. Okay. So the, uh, yes, because this, uh, if we uh, uh, change from the hydrogen plus to the oxygen, the theoretical voltage from, uh, will change from the 1.78 to the 1.23. You will see that there is uh, around 0.5 volt difference. So I think it's a major cause by the hydrogen phosphate decomposition. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And actually in your fuel cell testing, I noticed that normally the fuel cells uh, were tested in about 60 degrees Celsius, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so is the fuel cell performance very sensitive to temperature? Yes. For example, when you increase the temperature to 80 degrees Celsius or decrease the temperature down to 40 degrees Celsius, will you obtain very different fuel cell performance? Yes. And how different they are? Uh, uh, yes, that's a very good question. And um, uh, because um, we want to increase the performance uh, temperature even for the 90 degrees C, 90 degrees C, but the problem is the strong uh, decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. If we use a lower temperature like the 40 or 30 degrees C, the performance is not good. So that is a trade-off between the uh, operation temperature and uh, also the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. So that's the reason why we choose 60 for the uh, operation, fuel, fuel cell operation, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Professor Anliang. So are yeah, there any friend. other questions from the audience? Uh, so if you have any questions, please use chat. You can type your question. If there are no additional questions, uh, then uh, let's thank Professor Anlian again. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Yes, it's my pleasure. Yeah, to be here. Thank you.